Hi there, this is Dr. A with your second video in immunochemistry, and we're going to take a look at the unlabeled immunoassays. Okay, so the first one is going to be immune precipitation in gel. The um, gel can be dilute agarose dissolved in an aqueous buffer. Uh, in immune precipitation, um, you have to note there is a prozone, a postzone, and a zone of equivalence. So the Prozone is a zone of antibody excess, so there's too much antibody in relationship to the antigen for proper precipitation to happen. In the post zone, there's too much antigen and not enough antibody for proper precipitation to happen. And the zone of equivalence is the zone where you're going to have the precipitation, you'll have the reaction. So there's an optimal ratio of antibody to antigen, and so that will give you maximum precipitation, which then will make the reaction visible. So if, um, anything, any reaction that occurs in the prozone or the postzone could cause false negative tests. So the different methods for immune precipitation in gel, we have double diffusion. So that is the simplest and the least sensitive. It is a passive method. Um, you can use it to um, um, get the tighter value of an antigen. And um, the central well has an antibody and in, in the it's in a gel, and then the surrounding wells in that gel have decreasing concentration of the corresponding antigen to so that you can get your titer. You also have the single diffusion, which is also known as radial immunodiffusion. It can quantitate proteins, so proteins the antigen. Uh, it is also a passive method, and basically the larger the diameter of precipitation, the more protein is present. I have a couple of illustrations here for you. So this would be the double diffusion. So you would put uh, the sample in here with the antibody, and uh, you would have there the uh, you know different concentrations of uh, the antigen or you know whatever it is you're trying to detect with the titer. You find the titer if you're trying to titer the, the antibody. You just put different concentrations of antigens, and then you can get the titer because you're going to have uh, you know, maximum precipitation in that zone, and you will see a band forming <clears throat> there. All right, so the single diffusion is this one. So uh, you can see uh, different uh, bands here of precipitation, circles of precipitation. So uh, comparing all of them, this one would have the least uh, concentration. This one would have the highest concentration because you have the highest zone of precipitation. The next one is counter-immunoelectrophoresis. It uses an electrophile, so it's a type of electrophoresis. Um, and it's a modified um, basic immunoprecipitation technique. Um, and it uses an electrophoresis uh, gel and an electrophoresis uh, setup to enhance the rate of migration of the antigen and antibodies towards e each other, so in the gel matrix. So, um, you would have two wells in the gel. You would have a well with the antigen, a well with the antibody, and then you would run the current in this direction from negative pole to positive pole, and the current will help the antibody and antigens migrate towards each other, and then they would precipitate uh, in here, and it just so it happens faster. So it's a way to speed up. Um, so it's not no longer a passive reaction where you just wait for them to slowly diffuse towards each other. You kind of speed up the process using um, an electric field. Then you also have immunoelectrophoresis or <clears throat> immunofixation electrophoresis. So um, it is used to measure immunoglobulins as antibodies. So it's a combination of protein electrophoresis and then also with an antigen antibody uh, interaction to um, separate mixtures of proteins and then identify them. So um, the electrophoresis will separate the, the, the antibodies of proteins um, and then <clears throat> the antigen antibody reaction will be used to identify. Uh, <clears throat> the immunofixation electrophoresis can be used to identify abnormal bands, for example, seen on protein electrophoresis. They are typically seen in the gamma region, which is where uh, the gamma globulins or antibodies will precipitate out. And um, that can be done to determine whether the antibody immunoglobulin is um, abnormally produced and what type is abnormally produced. Oh, do we have too much IgG, IgA, IgM? So 
uh, immunofixation can help us answer that question. So, and uh, this one is immunoelectrophoresis. So it's a typical electrophoresis, your first band or spike is going to be albumin, and then you have the alpha-1 globulins, alpha-2 globulins, beta globulins, and then you have the gamma globulins are here, right here. So these are all your antibodies. And then there you have IgG, IgM, IgA, all of that's in your gamma globulins. So uh, in this one, we were testing patient's urine versus normal serum. And so, um, you um, you know they've run the electrophoresis and so the thicker the band the more of it is present so in in normal uh, serum this really thick one here is going to be albumin and we're going to have alpha 1 alpha 2 beta and this last one's going to be gamma globulin and then um, so we're running the patient's urine you can detect so if, if it's in the same position then that's what it is so uh, the patient has some albumin here in the, the their urine and then on this one, they've put anti-IgG, so it, the patient also has some IgG in their urine. Uh, and this is a normal serum to just kind of give you a control to see, okay, in normal serum, this is where IgG precipitates. There's some precipitin here, so the patient's got IgG. Uh, this one's IgA, uh, normal serum, so it precipitates here and you don't see it in the patient's urine, so there's no IgA in the patient's urine. Um, and then this one, uh, normal serum is anti-kappa and then also um, anti-lambda. So those are the short change of the immunoglobulins. And so you can see um, in normal serum, it's present. In the patient's urine, it's present. So then, you know, for sure we've got um, some um, patient's urine here. Sorry for the patient's urine here. That he has a lot of anti-kappa. That's the band and also anti-lambda, so that reaction. So uh, that means there is kappa chains and lambda chains and IgG. That's what the antibody has captured present in that patient's urine on top of the normal albumin or some albumin there um, that's going on. So uh, immunofixation electrophoresis, um, you would have um, a like a lighter kind of gradient here to, to show, and then uh, the, the full electrophoresis pattern, if you will. Um, and then this is separating out looking for uh, IgG, IgA, IgM, kappa, and lambda. And so it's a different look. They, they're precipitated out in bands and then um, detected. And so uh, you can actually get a concentration with those two. Uh, then you have the rocket technique is used for determining the concentration of a specific protein in a protein mixture. It involves a comparison of the sample of a known concentration with a series of dilutions of a known concentration of the protein they're trying to detect. It requires a monospecific antiserum against the protein under investigation, so monoclonal um, antibodies against the protein. Uh, the sample to be compared are loaded side by side in small circular wells along the edge of an agarose gel that contains the monospecific antibody diffused throughout the gel. And um, these samples, which are protein or the antigen you're trying to detect, are then electrophoresed into the agarose gel where the interaction between antigen and antibody will take place. Um, and in the presence of excess antigen, the antigen antibody complex is soluble, but as soon as it moves further into the gel, the more antigen combines with the antibody, then you will get to that zone of equivalence. Precipitation happens, and it becomes insoluble, and it makes this like rocket shape that spreads out from the loading well. This is what rocket immunoelectrophoresis would look like. The taller the rocket, then you know, the higher the concentration. And um, so next, we also have the detection of fluid phase antigens, antibody complexes. Um, it involves the use of an instrument to detect soluble antigen antibody complexes as they interact with light. So remember, we're, we're in unlabeled, so we, we don't have labels. A lot of these are used, um, you know, soluble reactions tend to have labels, but we can do them without labels. So the complexes, the antigen antibody complexes, will act as particles in suspension, suspension and those particles can scatter light. Uh, and the size of the particles will determine the type of light scatter that happens. So you have two ways to measure it. You have trimidimetry, which measures the light transmitted through the cuvette, um, and it looks how turbid it is. So the more 
antigen antibody complexes have precipitated or are forming in that liquid, the more turbid the, the cuvette is going to be and the less light is going to be transmitted through um, the cuvette. So its turbidimetry is designed to measure the light passing through a solution so that the detector is placed at an angle of 180, so exactly on the other side of the cuvette from the incident light that is shining through it. In nephilometry, it measures light scattered. So it measures light at an angle other than 180. So it's not on the other side. It's usually at a 90 degree uh, angle and it's looking for um, the light scatter. So you have the incident light, the light that's shining on the sample and then you have the little particles in solution and they're scattering light like a disco ball, if you will. And so you have to capture it at an angle because you're not trying to capture the light that's being shown through the, the sample. And the more little particles are in there, uh, the more light will be scattered. Um, and so if they use um, uh, around 90 or a little bit less than 90, uh, that works really well for the degree of detection because uh, the sensitivity is increased at that uh, angle. So uh, this shows you turbid, turbid samples and tur you know, turbid imagery would, could be used to uh, look at the concentration of those, how, how much light can be shined through uh, through the cuvette, through this, and um, be detected, transmitted, on, and detected on the other side. So it's all in one straight line to the detector. Um, whereas here, nephilometry, think, yeah, because I think disco ball, think uh, glitter, scattering light, right? So you shine the light on it, and then light scatters, and so we detect it here at an angle. There we go, that wraps up all the unlabeled assays. Um, and then uh, we're gonna be labeled assays and that's gonna be a much longer video. It's going to be our last one though. So I'll see you there.